In this video, we are going to take a look at classical probability. What sets classical probability aside is that we assume that all outcomes are equally likely. This is probably the most important feature of this entire video. This is the litmus test, which helps us identify classical probability. Now let's start with the example of flipping a coin. And we will be using the notation of P parentheses to represent probability of throughout this chapter. You know that when you are flipping a coin, the probability of flipping a heads is one out of two. And a probability of flipping a tails is one out of two. That is because there are two sides of the coin, one side each for heads and one side each for tails. Now I have a comment down at the bottom of the page that I'm uncovering that says, don't ever write 50-50. When we are describing a probability, we are describing it as either a fraction or a decimal, but never 50-50. Now, when you are rolling a die, there are six equally likely outcomes, and the probability of rolling a four is one out of those six outcomes. The probability of rolling an odd number, and that refers to the one, the three, or the five, that is three out of the six numbers, which reduces to one half. And the, rolling a seven is impossible on a single standard die. And so the probability there is going to be zero. Now, I do understand that there are special dice, especially if you play Dungeons and Dragons and some other games. But for your standard six-sided die, you do not have the number seven there on a single die. Now, the probability of E, the probability of an event is that notation that we're going to be dealing with on occasion throughout this chapter. The probability of an event is always between zero and one. The probability of an impossible event is zero, and the probability of a certain event is one. In other words, for this chapter, you should never have any negative answers, and you should never have any answers over one. Zero is your smallest answer, and one will be your largest answer any time that we are dealing with calculating a probability. Now, these pictures that you see at the right are rather important pictures for this entire chapter because they describe the probability in terms of a large number of repetitions called frequential interpretation of probability. It's the proportion of times event occurs if you have a large number of repetitions of an event. Now, we're going to begin by looking at two computer simulations of tossing a balanced coin 100 times. We know that when the number of tosses is smaller, you are going to fluctuate back and forth between uh, the probability of having all heads or all tails right at the very beginning. You're, it's either going to start with 100% or zero, OK? And you know that when you flip a coin 100 times, you're not necessarily going to get 50 heads and 50 tails. OK, it's going to go back and forth. You're going to have streaks of heads and streaks of tails. But in the long run, those are the key words. In the long run, you know what the expected value is going to be. In this case, it will be 50%. OK, in the short term, you might not be at 50%, but in the long term, you will. That is a very key concept for this chapter. Now, at the top of this next page, I've got a dice table all filled in. You might want to pause the video here and fill this in on your own so that you get to know it better. Basically, along the sides, you have the values one through six for each die. And inside the table, the 36 numbers that you see there range from two when you roll double ones and add the dice together up through 12, which is double sixes. 
Okay, but again, I note that you have six rows and six columns. So there are 36 possible ways that you can roll dice, two dice, and find their sum. Now, when you are rolling two dice, what's the probability of rolling a two? Well, that only shows up one time within that grid. So one out of 36 is the probability of rolling a two with two dice. The probability of a seven shows up quite a bit of times in this table. In fact, it's the most likely outcome. It happens to show up six times. And you can see that on this diagonal, that is the most likely outcome, followed by six and eight, and then five and nine. So the probability here, since seven shows up six times, is seven out of, sorry, six out of 36, which reduces to one out of six. And the probability of rolling a five, for example, refers to these five outcomes in which I'm rolling the dice, and there are four of them. And so the probability here would be four out of 36. Sorry, that was multiples of five. So I wasn't paying attention here. That includes the tens. Remember, you've got five times one and five times two. So now I have five, six, and seven, meaning we have seven out of 36 as a probability of rolling a multiple of five. Now let's move on to a definition. And this definition is that of a sample space. The sample space is a listing, the listing being the key word there of all the possible outcomes of an experiment. So in the example above, when we are rolling the dice, your outcomes are gonna be two through 12. So the sample space for that experiment would be the numbers two through 12 listed out as a set. Notice I've used bracket notation to denote that I have a set of all of the possible outcomes. Okay, now let's take a little time and let me tell you a couple of stories here. <clears throat> when I first got married, um, there's some things you don't find out until after you get married. This is kind of a funny little story. My wife and I were having our honeymoon in Las Vegas. And we happened to walk by a craps table, which involves the game of dice. And my wife said, I'm really good at rolling dice. And I'm going, oh, no, 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 we're not doing, we're not going there. She goes, yeah, really? She says, you know, I played a lot of Yahtzee when I was a kid. And I was able to roll doubles and, you know, five of a kind a lot. And I said, no, 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 no. There's no skill to rolling the dice. Every time you roll the dice, you have the same probability of each different number. There's no special skill involved. And we joked about it over the years. And finally, when our son was in junior high and it was time to come up with a science experiment, um, you know, that attitude of, I don't know what I should do. What should I do? I suggested that we test whether my wife was better than the average person at rolling dice. Now, we didn't want to roll five dice as in Yahtzee because that was a lot of data that we needed to keep track of. And when you do a science fair experiment, you need to keep track of your data so you can support your conclusions along the way. So instead of rolling five dice, we decided to roll three dice. And we decided that the skill was going to be rolling either doubles or three of a kind with three dice. And one person would roll the dice. My wife would take her turn, roll the dice. The other person would type the numbers into an Excel spreadsheet. And they'd do that repeatedly. Then they'd take turns and switch off. And my son would roll the dice quite a few times. And then my wife would record the data. And we were looking to see whether my wife was quote, better and more successful at rolling doubles or three of a kind. Well, we see inside this dice chart that we have right here that there are six times six, which is equal to 36 outcomes. And that's what we based our probabilities over here at the left on. Well, in this problem, 
Um, there are six times six times six is equal to 216 outcomes. 216 ways you can roll three dice. So how many times do you think I had them rolling the dice each? Now, if you guessed 216 times, you're wrong, okay? I had them each roll the dice 2,160 times. Why did I do that? I did that because I like to win. And I know that, quite honestly, if I can get a larger number of trials, okay, going on and on and on, the more trials we go with, the more likely the outcomes are going to be what the probability says that they're going to be. So 2,160 times each took a very long time, but it was exactly what I designed ahead of time in that experiment. Now, I did the calculations and I said, theoretically, the probability that you would roll doubles or three of a kinds with three dice was four out of nine, which turns into 44.44 repeating percent. Now, by golly, what happened? One of them landed right on this 44.44% and one of them ended in a 0.45 at the end. So there was almost no deviation at all. And for all practical purposes, no one had a better skill and both of them performed exactly how they should have. Now, did his report end up worth him saying, and dad was right? You don't think so? No, it wasn't that way. And my wife and I still banter back and forth on this issue, but a little bit more jokingly now than before. Okay, that's to illustrate that idea of in the long run. That's why I mentioned that to you. Now we have the theoretical probability of what the odds say is going to happen. And that was that 44.44%. And then we have what actually does happen. Now, sometimes you do get uncanny behavior or unpredictable behavior, but those are anomalies. Okay, and they are balanced out in the long run. Now, all of Las Vegas is built upon that principle. They know what the long-term odds are. Okay, that's exactly what they're doing. When they have a particular game, be it roulette or be it baccarat or be it craps or blackjack, they know what the probability is that you will win each event. As long as they can get you to Las Vegas, then they know what's gonna happen, okay? This is all based on getting you to the casino, okay? Once you are at the casino, everything is in their favor. That's why when you go to rent a hotel in Las Vegas, they're offering you a couple nights at a very low price because they don't want you coming just for one night. They want you to stay there because if you're staying there, what are you gonna do? You're gonna gamble. You're gonna put money into the shows. You're gonna do those sorts of things. And they don't mind lower prices on the different shows that are out there, et cetera. They don't mind all those coupons and the glitz and the things they put out there because it gets you there to play the games. And if you play the games, they have a predictable cut that they're gonna make on each bet. Now let's pretend that we have a loose slot machine. And let's pretend that it is advertised as a 97% payback. Well, what does that mean? That means you're gonna win if you play properly, $97 back out of every $100 you spend. Well, let's talk about that. That means that they are going to earn, if you flip that around, three bucks out of every $100 you spend. Well, that doesn't sound all that interesting to you, but if you spend a thousand bucks and we multiply the denominator by 10, now they've made 30 bucks. If we make that $10,000 bet, Add another zero up in the numerator, there's 300. If you get a $100,000 bet, they know they're gonna make 3,000, etc. For every million dollars, 
they know that they're going to make approximately 30,000. Okay, it is bank, so to speak, for them. Now, I said there a moment ago, if you play the game properly, okay, with a slot machine, you may say, well, how can I not play a game properly? Well, in order to win the major jackpots, you have to place a maximum bet. And even on the $1 slots or the penny slots, a penny slot, let's just go with that. You might have to put 50, play 50 different lines and or play 50 cents per spin in order to win that major jackpot. If you do not put 50 cents in or the maximum bet and you land on the triple sevens or whatever it is that wins that jackpot, you get a reduced payout. Well, the 97% is based upon your playing the game correctly. Okay, another thing I like to describe is certain payoffs. Let's say that a game ha has a payoff of three to two. For example, that's when you are rolling a five or a nine in the game of craps. Okay, well, in that sort of situation, for every $2 you spend, they're going to give you three. But let's pretend you bet $5. Well, that five can be split up into two, two, and one. They can pay three to each of those two, but for that last one dollar, they can't pay three to two. We don't have a one dollar fifty cent payoff, so they only pay off one. And guess what? That mistake in how you bet just went more so in their favor. It increased their income, so to speak, and it decreased your potential winnings. And that's all built into the game. That's why I always explain to people, if you're going to go to Las Vegas, don't expect it to be a winning experience. Mathematically speaking, you have to go to enjoy yourself and be able to afford any potential losses. But if you are going to play a game, know your game well so that you play it properly. You guys, when you play a video game, you spend tons of hours poring over the rules. And if you get stuck at a particular level, you, you go online, you ask your friends, how do you get past, you know, level 16, past the wizard or whatever, and you get a cheat or you learn the directions, you learn how to play the game. The same thing should be true in Las Vegas. Know the game so you can avoid some of those pitfalls. Now let me ask you guys a question, and I'm going to ask you to pause the video after I ask this question and think about it, and then I will tell you what the answer is. Okay, here we go. The question is, at which hospital is it more likely to have 75% of the babies born on a random day to be girls? Is it the UCLA Medical Center? or is it our local Desert Valley Hospital? Think about it for a second and pause, and then I will release the answer. Okay, now let's think about this. The UCLA Medical Center is a rather large hospital. So let's pretend that on a particular day, 40 babies are born. Now, for it to have 75% of the babies born are girls, you would need 30 out of the 40 babies to be born girls. Now, if there's a 50% chance of a boy and a girl, you would expect about 20 out of the 40 to be boys and 20 to be girls. But could it happen that you get 30 out of 40 are girls? Yeah. Is it as likely? No, but if we look at the Desert Valley Hospital, which is a smaller hospital, and I'm just going to keep the numbers simple and pretend they only have four babies born on a given day, would you potentially believe that three out of four could be girls? Yeah, it's much more likely in a smaller hospital. When you have a larger number of trials, such as at UCLA, it's supposed to be closer to the 20 out of 40, closer to the 50% ratio. But our answer here is in a smaller number of trials, a smaller number of babies being born, that is when you're going to have more of the deviation. And it goes right back to that chart 
that I was showing you back on this first page here. More deviation when there's a smaller number of trials, less deviation approaching the expected value when you have a larger number of trials. Okay, these are some of the concepts that I want you to understand in this chapter. Okay, fun little comic strip here. Yes, the jackpot is huge, but at least the old candy machine was a guaranteed win. Okay. Now we used to have these older slot machines that have the handle on them, and they were known as the one-armed bandit because it looked like one arm and they were bandits, they took your money away. Now we just have the buttons you push to run your bet. Well, it used to be when you pulled the handle and the things would spin around, it might take five seconds for the, the spinning to stop. And you might only be able to place about 12 or 15 bets per minute. Well, when you have push the button and things happen a lot more quickly, you might be able to play 20 or 30 times per minute. And the money is just going into the machine all the more quickly. That's by design. It really is. It's all about getting you there to gamble more and more frequently, more money and more frequently. Another comic strip. Yes, you're growing up, Liam. No more kid pancakes. These are then pancakes. I just love the expression on that kid's face. And we'll be talking about Venn diagrams in just a moment. Here we go. Venn diagrams are a way to illustrate different outcomes in a visual sort of way. I'm gonna draw a Venn diagram for, let's start with this A and B in the middle here. For A and B, I'm gonna draw two circles, one representing event A, one representing event B, and A and B is the overlap in the center section. Okay, I'm going to show you that sometimes instead of using the ampersand symbol, we use the word and, or we use the union symbol. Sorry, I've got that mixed up. I've got the wrong symbol here. The union symbol goes over with or, and the overlap is what we're talking about here. Where do these two overlap? Now, when you have the word or, Basically, we have these two circles, but it's not just the intersection that or where they overlap that we shade. And we basically shade in all of A and all of B as well as the overlap section. Now, sometimes we use the word or, sometimes we use the word union, but in this case, we join the two sets together. Now, in the event not E, I left E empty. Everything else in that rectangle is shaded in. And that rectangle technically is called the universe. So all of the universe except for events E is being described there. Okay, so I've got these pictures described in words down below. Not A means the event that A does not occur. A and B means the event the event that both A and event B occur, and that's the overlap there in the center of that picture up top. Event A or B is the event that either A or event B occur, and you can apply or both of them if you want. Now for any event E, there's a corresponding event defined by the condition E does not occur. It's called the complement of E and is denoted by not E. So that not E is actually illustrating the complement. Now, the first thing we wanna do is we wanna learn how these unions and intersections work. So I'm gonna begin by giving you three sets. The first set is the numbers one, two, and three. The second set, set B, will be the numbers one, three, and five. And set C will consist of the numbers four, five, and six. When I ask you to find A union B, I'm asking you to join sets A and B together. So that takes the one, two, three, and the one, three, five, joining them together, and that will give the numbers one, two, three, and five. Notice the one was a repeat and the three was a repeat, but I did not list it twice. 
It's as if two people are getting married and they each have a toaster. So when they get married, they only need one toaster in the house. So they donate the other one or have a garage sale with all the duplicate items. The union symbol is an or, and it says unite the sets together. Moving across, if we're looking at A union C, basically that gives us all of the numbers from one through six. Now moving on to the intersections. A intersect B says, what is the overlap between those two sets? What numbers are in both A and B? And the answer is the values or the elements one and three. What elements are in the intersection of A and C? Well, there is no overlap between sets A and C. So we can write this in either two ways. We can either use the empty set notation or we can use the empty set notation, which is the zero with the slash through it. For a long time in the 1970s and 80s, we had dot matrix printers and they printed out zeros with a slash through them so that you could tell a zero and an, the letter O apart from each other. And it really did us a disservice because null set zero are two totally different things. And we wanted, it just a, it was a bad notation. Luckily, we don't write our zeros with slashes through them very much any longer. Another example. A die is tossed, and I want you to consider the following events. Now, this is a standard six-sided die. I want us to say that event A is the event that an even number is rolled, B means that an odd number is rolled, and C is the event that a one, two, or three is rolled. Okay, so again, we're going to describe the outcomes that comprise each of these events. Now, for A and B, that is like A intersect B using that intersect symbol that we see right there. A and B, what numbers are both even and odd? Well, there is no number that's both even and odd. There is no overlap. So we write no answer, or null set. A and C, what is the overlap of being even and being a one, two, or three? Well, two is the only even number in that list. So two would be the element that comprises that intersection. Not C, that means not a one, two, or three, meaning it would have to be a four, five, or six, because one through six are all the possible outcomes in the sample space of rolling a single die. A or B, now with the word or, we are joining our sets together. So for A or B, we're joining the evens and the odds together. So we have all of the numbers from one through six. And for A or C, we have all of the evens. And then when we throw one and three in there, basically the only number we don't have is five. So our set consists of one, two, three, four, and six, skipping over the five. Now notice we haven't started calculating probabilities yet. Right now we are practicing with identifying outcomes that are in particular sets. We're going to switch our attention in a moment, though. Okay, now I've got a picture of a deck of cards, a little bit different than the one in your notes, but basically we have four different suits. Um, we've got, from top to bottom in my picture, spades, hearts, diamonds, and clubs. The spades and the clubs are black cards, and the hearts and the diamonds are the red cards. There are 13 numbers in each suit. So 13 times four makes 52 cards in the deck. 26 are black, 26 are red. The ace is like a number one. And then after the ace through 10, we have a jack, queen, and king. The jack, queen, and king, depending upon the game you're playing are like a 11, 12, and a 13. Other games that you play with cards will count them each as 10 points. But these cards that have a picture on them are called face cards. So we have 52 cards in a deck of cards. And I know not everybody is a game player with a game of cards, but it's a great way to learn some of these probabilities. Typically, however, I do not put these on 
exams because I want things to be a little bit more familiar to you on an exam. So we are gonna consider a shuffle deck of 52 cards. That's great, we want them shuffled so that every card is equally likely. And we're going to draw one card at a time. And I've identified these four different possible outcomes. A will be that a club is chosen, B that we choose a face card, C that specifically the six of spades is chosen, and D the event that a six is chosen. So now up at the top right of our screen, we're gonna find not a listing of the outcomes, but we're gonna be asked for probabilities. What's the probability of A? What's the probability that we choose a club? Well, there are 13 clubs in this deck. So we could either say 13 out of 52, or we could reduce it and say, hey, that's one of the four suits that reduces to one out of four. The probability of B, the probability of drawing a face card. Well, we have three face cards in each of the four suits, which means there are 12 out of the 52 cards are face cards. Now 12 and 52 are both divisible by two, that's even. And actually they're both divisible by four also, so that will reduce to three out of 13. And another way of looking at that is in each of these rows, three of the 13 cards are face cards. For the probability of C, we are asking, what is the probability that we draw the six of spades? Well, that is one particular card in the entire deck. And so the probability of that is gonna be one out of 52. And the probability of a D, that is the probability of choosing a six, there are four different sixes in the deck of cards. So we are gonna have four out of 52, or if we reduce it, that is one out of 13. So previously we are, were identifying outcomes. Now we were just calculating probabilities. And now we're about to move on to describing events in words. I want you to be able to do any of those three things on your next test. The first set that we are gonna describe is not A. Now, instead of describing it as not choosing a club, I want you to describe it in terms of what it is instead of what it isn't. So I'm going to say choosing a diamond heart or spade. Don't say choosing anything but a club. Give it to in positive terms. If we're talking about the class being half empty or half full, we're talking about the half full, what it is as opposed to what it isn't. A and D, that's the overlap of being a club and being a six. Well, the only overlap of being a club and being a six, let me circle that. That's like being in the top row here. There's all my clubs. Sorry, that was all my spades. That's the bottom row. Let me move my little circle down there. Try that really quickly. There we go. There is a bottom row with all the clubs. And then we have all the sixes in the second or in that one column I've circled. Well, the overlap is specifically in one particular position, and that is the six of clubs. So a six of clubs is chosen is the way that I'm gonna describe that there. A or C, now we have A, which is a club, so everything down in that bottom row, or the six of spades, that's a particular value here. Now there is no overlap here, so there's no great easy way to describe this one. So I've just listed this as choosing a club or the six of spades. Sometimes there's not a nice, neat way to compact that together. Now, back on the one before this, I did not say choosing a six and choosing a club because the six of clubs was the overlap. If there is an overlap or an easier way to describe the event in words, we are to do it in that way. Okay, now we're going to take a little sidestep for a moment and talk about odds. Odds is not a major topic in this chapter. I'm only introducing it right now, and it's not something we're going to use much in this course at all. 
or even at all. It's only right here in this portion of the chapter. So the odds that an event occur can be found by using the ratio of the number of ways it can occur to the number of ways it cannot occur. So let's find the odds of roll two with a single die. Okay, I need to look at the number of ways it can happen, the number of ways I can roll a two, and then the number of ways I can't roll a two. Well, a two is a single outcome on the die, so there's one way it can happen, and there are five ways it can't happen. Okay, that's not the same as the probability of rolling a two, because that would be one out of six. This is one not out of five, but one to five. When we are dealing with odds, we either write this as the phrase one to five, or we write it using a colon, okay? It's the same type of odds that you would see at a racetrack if you were to look at the listings there. Although, although at a racetrack, the horse probabilities that they will run um, are not calculated in exactly this way. Okay, a second example. I've got a class with 18 men and 14 women in it, and I wanna find the probability of choosing a woman at random. Well, in this case, it's not the same as the odds. I would say, oh, there are 14 women out of a total of 32 people. I found that 32 by adding the 18 and 14 together. So my probability here is gonna be 14 out of those 32, and I reduced that fraction by dividing by two over two. Now, let me mention something about calculators and fractions here for you. I'm gonna switch our screen to the calculator screen, and you all have the ability to say, what was the probability there? 14 divided by 32. If you go 14 divided by 32, it's gonna give you a decimal answer. Anytime in this class you want to reduce a fraction and you don't want it as a decimal, you can hit your math button, which gives you this first choice. And that's the choice we want. So we're gonna hit enter, enter, and it will reduce that well, first off, it converted the decimal to a fraction, but it also reduced that fraction. If you wanted to do it in a single step, you can take 14 divided by 32, and instead of hitting enter, just go math, enter, enter, and it will reduce that fraction for you. Provided your denominator is not over, a, I think it's 999 for most of your calculators. So um, take advantage of that. That takes away a bit of the stress in this chapter if you're not great with fractions. It will do the reducing for you. Okay, let's go back to our blue screen here. Now we've just found the probability of choosing a woman. Now I want to find the odds of choosing a woman. So the odds of a woman, I need to find the number of ways that I can choose a woman to the number of ways I can't. Well, there are 14 ways I can and 18 ways I can't. So 14 to 18 would be that ratio. And those are both even, and I can divide by two over two to get seven over nine. And I would say that the odds of choosing a woman are seven to nine. Okay, now I wanna change our focus to look at drawing tree diagrams. They're great devices that will help you to determine all the different outcomes and what their probabilities are. So I'm gonna begin by using a tree diagram to find the sample space for the gender of three children in a family. Now I've already got this drawn out and in many of the drawings we do in the rest of the chapter, you might want to pause the video and fill these things in. But what I did is I had these different branches. When the first baby is boy, born, it will either be a boy or a girl. And then if the first boy, baby is a boy, then we have our next branch in the top half of the second 
column. But if the first baby was a girl, then our second baby is the one I'm drawing to now in the bottom half of the second column. And then we'd have four more branches um, for, the, for the third. So a lot of people look at all these seven different sideways triangular drawings and it looks like we've got seven babies being born. But we only read these in columns from left to right because this is an if structure. You follow the path through to the desired outcome. Now, all of the outcomes for this experiment are listed here at the right starting with boy, 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 if you go straight across the top of each branch, and then boy, boy, girl, et cetera, going down this listing. And I recommend you pause and write that and get used to the pattern that you see there. Now that whole column of all those outcomes collectively is the sample space. Remember how we said that the sample space is a listing of all of the possible outcomes for an experiment? Well, that's what we're seeing right there. We will be using these tree diagrams quite a bit, especially in the second half of this chapter. Okay, now let's move on to some probability rules and some definitions. Two events are said to be mutually exclusive if they can't both occur at the same time. And these next two blanks go together. A, a collection of mutually exclusive and collectively exhaustive events occurs if, now let me stop here for a second because the whole phrase mutually exclusive and collectively exhaustive all goes together as a single phrase together. Now, in order to be mutually exclusive and collectively exhaustive, each event needs to be mutually exclusive of all the others. And in other words, they can't occur at the same time. And the union of the events is the sample space. Now that's kind of vague, so let me illustrate it with this example, okay? I've got rolling a die and I've got these three possible outcomes. We will say set A means rolling a one or a two, event B will be rolling a three or a four, and event C will be rolling a four, five, or a six. Now, if I'm looking at the event A and B, can A and B occur at the same time? No, there's no overlap between the two. So they are mutually exclusive of each other but they are not collectively exhaustive because we've got a problem here. There's no four, five, and six involved. Okay, for B and C, and you know what? I really shouldn't be calling these ands. These should probably be a union here, joining the sets together. So I'm gonna change that to a union. And I'm gonna change this one to a union. Okay, so when I unite B and C, B and C, those two sets are not mutually exclusive because they both contain the number four. There is an overlap between the two of those. You know what, I'm almost debating having those unions there because I noticed that there is an intersection here. These are just logically looking at the two sets together. Now, in this case, I said, they're not mutually exclusive because they have a value in common, nor are they collectively exhausted because all the numbers one through six for rolling a die are not included. But if I uni unite all three of the sets together, they still aren't mutually exclusive, but they are collectively exhaustive because all the numbers from one through six are included within those three sets. Now, we have some addition rules, and I don't usually use these first two rules super directly. You'll see why as we move on. But whenever we have a probability with the word or in it, the or is going to turn into addition. We find the probability of A or B. That'll be the probability of A or the probability of B, but we'll find the probabilities separately and add them together. Now that is when A and B are mutually exclusive, meaning there is no overlap. 
But I have a second formula for adding the probability of A or B. Again, the or turns into addition. But if there is an intersection, if there is an overlap between those two, we need to subtract it up. Now, there was no overlap up above because they, we said that they were mutually exclusive. I just always tell people, whenever you see or, add your probabilities together and then ask yourself, is there any repeat values or calculations that I need to subtract off? Now, the complement rule says the probability of an event is one minus the probability of the event not occurring. For example, if I'm rolling a die, I can either roll a five as one outcome, or the opposite of it is rolling a one, two, three, four, or a six. Those events are complements of each other. Now, since all probabilities add up to one, if I want the probability of the five rolling a five, it's the complement. I, I take the five out of six, subtract it from six out of six to get the one out of six, which is the probability of five. You will see this one in action in a little bit also. So here we go. Let's talk about an example of rolling a die. We're gonna say the event A is that of rolling a three. Now I'm just gonna tell you right here that not A would be the event of not rolling a three, just for an example for you. B will be the event that we roll a two, and C will be the event that a number less than three is rolled. That means don't include the three, but specifically the one or the two. So if I'm rolling a single standard six-sided die, and I wanna know what's the probability of rolling A, a three, we already know this to be one out of six. If I want the probability of A or B, well, A, is rolling a three and B is rolling a two, they are mutually exclusive of each other. So I can take the one out of six for the A and the one out of six probability for the B, add them together to get two out of six, which is one third. The probability of B, rolling a B, that's just two out of six there. The number two out of all six, that's one of the six outcomes. The probability of not A. Well, not A means not rolling a three. I can say rolling some other number and get to five out of six that way. Or I can use the complement rule and say, ah, start with one, subtract off the probability of A, which we know is one out of six from up above, and find that one minus one out of six is five out of six. The probability of C, rolling a number that's less than three. Now by less than three, I'm referring to the one or the two. That is two possible outcomes. So that is two out of six, which reduces to one over three. Now here where I've got B or C, this is where it gets a little bit interesting and we've got this general addition rule taking over. When I look for the probability of B or C, I'm, B is the event that a two is rolled. C less than three means a one or two is rolled. Notice how these are not mutually exclusive. I can't just add their probabilities together. So in this case, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna find the probability of B, I'm gonna add on the probability of C, but then I'm gonna subtract off the probability of their intersection. Now, probability of B is one out of six. We're gonna add in the probability of C, which is two out of six. We're gonna subtract the probability of the overlap. The overlap is B and C. Now, B and C, that intersection of B and C is specifically rolling the two. So that has a probability of one out of six. And now when you add these together, those one sixths cancel each other out and you get two sixths, which reduces to one third. Okay, that might take you a little time to kind of sort through. Um, you don't have to apply those rules if you just innately understand the structure. I'm not gonna be a nitpicky uh, detailed person on 
uh, the steps you write out on this. I just want us to be able to get accurately to the answers. And we're quite honestly not going to be doing these rolling a dice problems very much. Most of our problems will be a little bit more beyond this, but then they will be a little bit more understandable. Okay, let me illustrate this addition rule in another way. I said, a card is chosen at random from a deck of 52 cards. Find the probability of choosing a heart or a queen. Heart or queen. If I consider the heart to be the A's and a queen to be right there, or Finding the probability of heart or a queen really says I'm looking for everything that's shaded in in blue, including the intersection there. Written another way, I'm going to say the probability of a heart or a queen is equal to the probability of a heart plus a probability of a queen. But because there is an overlap of the queen of hearts, I need to subtract that overlap off. It is the queen of hearts is being counted amongst the hearts and it's being counted amongst the queens and you can't give it two counts, so to speak, or two votes. The probability of a heart is 13 out of 52. It does reduce, but I'm gonna leave it over 52 so that all of these have a common denominator. The probability of a queen is four out of 52. And this overlap that I'm subtracting off is one out of 52. So if you add these together, I get 17 minus one. That gives me 16 over 52, at which if I cut numerator and denominator in half, gives me eight out of 26. And if I divide both by two again, I get four over 13 as the answer. So I generally just ask and I, or say, hey, there's an or in this problem. Or turns into addition. Is there a way for there to be an overlap between the conditions of being a heart and being a queen? And the answer is yes, the queen of hearts. And so I just always know I'm going to subtract off the overlap. See, I don't like to have two formulas for A or B. I'd rather just go always with looking for the subtraction. And if there is nothing to subtract off, then it just reverts back to the irregular addition rule. It's up to you which way you want to view it. I'm going to stop that video there.